Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck and Jerry's here, too. And this is Stuff You Should Know. I don't know how to say that in Esperanto. Now that I think about it, I really should have looked that up. I was wondering if you were going to do that. I can't believe I didn't. I feel kind of jerky. Jerk waddy, no. I guess. I don't know how to say that in Esperanto either. <laughs> well, jerk wad would be jerk wado. Yeah, exactly. Or, or something some, like that. Something similar to that, yeah. It actually would make sense because Esperanto is is taking um, root words, jerk, mm-hmm. wad, and putting them together and then conjugating them in a very uniform way. We should probably tell everybody what we're talking about here because we just kind of accidentally got into it. Yeah, it's a language. Not just period. a language, it's a conlang, a constructed language, which is um, a language that you sit down and make up. Um, some people actually do this, and apparently it's addictive when you start, um, as opposed to, like, a, I guess, a natural language, one that just kind of develops organically over time as a group of people start talking to one another. Yeah, uh, Esperanto itself means one who hopes. And that will all make sense once you hear the story, because it's it's a pretty wonderful story, actually. Uh, I didn't know much about it. I just thought it was kind of one of these goofy fringe things. Uh, And it is a fringe thing. There are about um, a thousand people who are native, not just Esperanto speakers, but where their first language that they learned was Esperanto. They are native speakers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dave Roos helped us with this, and he dug up uh, George Soros. Uh, billionaire, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm sure people describe him in a lot of ways, depending on who you are. Mm -hmm. But uh, as the most famous Esperanto speaker, but I did poke around a little bit and found that uh, Tolstoy, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, spoke Esperanto, and Lumiere, the basically the the father of modern cinema. Uh, And as this will be come as a surprise when you see later on what happened, but Joseph Stalin apparently knew how to speak Esperanto. Huh. That is kind of a surprise. The thing I think that differentiates George Soros, though, is he was a native speaker. Like, that was his first language was Esperanto. Yeah, but I looked over the list of just speakers. Right. Notable speakers. And there are a lot of people on the list, but I just hadn't heard of many of them. Stalin's a big surprise. I'd like to add one more to that list of notable Esperanto speakers, our own Ben Bolin from <laughs> Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. I thought he spoke Esperanto. That that tracks. He did. I emailed him just to make sure that I wasn't just making something up in my head. And he yeah. said, yeah, he used to, you know, be into it. And he just kind of fell out of it. And then he emailed me like hours later and was like, damn it, Josh, now I'm back into Esperanto. So he's back into it, everybody. Well, learning Esperanto is about as Ben Bolin a thing as I can imagine. It is because um, (laughs) it's inclusive, it's intelligent, it's curious people, it's witty. Um, It seems to be like one of the better, most um, more um, uh, nice or kind online yeah. communities that you'll come across from what I can and, tell. And it's fringe, and that's that's Ben. For sure. Uh, yeah, and again, that's Ben Bolin from Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. That's right. Uh, so you said it was a constructed language. Um, I guess we'll talk a little bit about why people would construct a language and a little bit of the history of these languages. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for doing that. Most of them uh, are because they want to create a language that's easier to learn, uh, that's simpler. A lot of times there might be religious reasons or philosophical reasons. Some people just do it for fun. Uh, a lot of them were designed to be a universal language in Esperanto. Actually, Esperanto ticks a lot of these boxes, as we'll see. But a lot of them are created for like, hey, wouldn't it be better if everybody could speak a language yeah, worldwide? a universal language, a language where... Um if you, I guess the whole point of a universal language is this is definitely the point of Esperanto. The idea is that if you can speak a common language with anybody else on the planet, mm-hmm. that should conceivably do away with a lot of different conflicts that mm-hmm. probably arise from disputes over language, from differences in language, from an inability to see one another's viewpoint because we're having trouble talking with one another. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of the, the basis of a lot of the constructed languages, that idea that if we can all speak a universal language, there'll be a, um, a, a, a global human um, family or world, which that does sound like you'd be up George Soros's alley. Yeah, I mean, if you if you just could create a language that where all it was was don't shoot, and how about a plate of cookies and a glass of milk? Oh yeah, it'd be you know a, how far we go? It'd be a much better world. <laughs> so invented languages have you know people have always sort of been doing this here and there, but in the 19th century. Uh, it seems to have really hit its stride. There mm-hmm. were more than a hundred uh, constructed languages that de- uh, not decade that century alone. And Esperanto is far and away the most popular today. Although for a long, long time it was a language created by a German priest named Johann uh, Schleyer uh, called Volu- Volupuk. Yeah, Volupuk. Um, apparently, God told him to do it. Sure, mission from God. Yeah, what else are you going to do? You're going to make that language. And I'm sure he was like, are you sure you want to call it Volapuk? And God was like, get busy. And he did. And it actually caught on really well. There seems to have been kind of a bug in the late 19th century, at least in the West, of um, invented languages. Mm -hmm. And Volapuk apparently fit the the bill, and it spread far and wide. (laughs) I can't not say it like that. I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, they started having like international congresses or um, conferences of of mm-hmm. Volapük. Um, President Grover Cleveland's wife Frances named their dog Volapük. Like it was it was a, a, a worldwide phenomenon. And even if you didn't know it or had no interest in learning it, you knew about it. Yeah, that's because that dog threw up all over the place, though. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, we had a cat named Underfoot. Literally, oh, my dad named this name. cat Underfoot. That's a very good name. And I'll give you two guesses why. Uh, because the cat had very long legs. Okay. And no feet to speak of. That's right. It was it. underfooted. <laughs> so that conference you were talking about for Vada Puke was 1889, but a couple of years before that, so it was, you know, cruising and doing pretty well. But two years before that, Esperanto was created and really took it over, you know, over the next, like, 30, 40 years or so. I mean, imagine there being a trend today of, like, a universal language just catching on, like, on TikTok. Oh, God. Like, it would just take off, but it's such a bizarre thing to think of. And this (laughs) is what people were into, and this was long before social media. So it was hard for something to become a global phenomenon, and yet not one, but two universal languages took hold in the 1880s. Um, yeah. So Esperanto apparently just totally supplanted um, Volapük, but there is a little footnote of it. <laughs> that apparently the uh, Danes say um, if what we would say, like, it's all Greek to me, like, I don't understand what you're saying. The, uh-huh. the Danish expression is, it's pure Volapük. Puk. That makes sense. It, yeah, it's great. I, I yeah. love that. I love learning Danish expressions. I'm going to start saying that. I don't say it's all Greek to me much anyway, mm-hmm. but uh, if that ever comes up, I'm going to say it's pure volapuke. Yeah, and no offense to our Greek listeners, it's just something someone says here. Yeah, I wonder what Greeks think about that, actually. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's gotten back to them yet. <laughs> yeah, uh, so should we talk a little bit about this, uh, the creator of Esperanto, who was, uh, I tried to find out bad things about this guy, but he seems like a pretty remarkable Humble, well-intentioned fella. Mm-hmm. And I also read that he was one of those rare people and um, who would sleep just a couple hours a night. Uh, and rather than sit around and, like, stare at the wall, he did yeah. interesting things. He was a polyglot. He learned tons of different languages. He was well-read. He was an optometrist. He did all sorts of stuff. But along the way, one of the things he did was create um, uh, uh, Esperanto. And he had a pretty great well, not great, but a pretty heavy backstory to it. Yeah, his name, we haven't even said his name yet. Uh, he's known as L.L. Zamenhof, uh, or Zamenhof, uh, but it, his full name was Ludwig uh, Leitzer Zamenhof, born on December 15th, which is National uh, Zamenhof Day. Oh, that worldwide. makes sense, sure. Yeah. Uh, in 1859, born in uh, Bialystok, Poland, uh, he was Jewish, as was a lot of Bialystok, about 70%. Uh, also some Germans, some Russians, obviously Poles. 
And growing up there was pretty rough because there was a lot of ethnic violence going on. There were uh, Jews being attacked by Poles. There were Germans being attacked by Russians. Um, in 1881, there was a, uh, a false, um, I guess, accusation that Jews were behind the assassination of Alexander II of Russia. Mm -hmm. And that started the uh, pogroms, which were these organized massacres of uh, Polish and Russian Jewish communities. Yeah, because um, Poland was annexed by Russia from 1807 to 1921, which is why they would have cared. That was their czar. Um, and uh, apparently it wasn't the Jews at all mm -hmm. or anybody who had anything to do with Jewishness. It was anti-autocratics, a uh, group of um, called the Narodnia Volia, People's Will. And they threw a bomb and blew him up. And apparently his successor, his son, Tsar Alexander III, was even worse. But from those pogroms that, um, that L.L. Zamenhof was alive, alive to witness, and even before that, just the ethnic violence that was endemic to Bialystok, um, that had a really big effect on him. And that's where he developed this idea that um, humanity is way more connected than we realize, that we have all these false constructs that separate mm -hmm. us that don't have to separate us, but do time and time again. Language is one of them. He cited religion as one of them. And he was very um, Jewish. He was a very religious Jewish person, but he still recognized that religion creates conflict sometimes. It has historically. Um, and uh, he felt like you could kind of you could keep the religion, you could keep the, the different nations, you can keep the things that do divide us um, as long as they they had something like a universal language laying over the whole thing that could that could um, defuse the conflicts that grow up from those things that divide us. Yeah, which was, and he was a kid. I mean, this is remarkable stuff for a, a, a preteen and then teenager to sort of understand. So he's Clearly a brilliant, uh, empathetic, passionate human being. Yeah. Uh, I think the, as the you know family story goes, at least, he was 10 years old, and he wrote a play called uh, The Tower of Babel, colon, uh, The Bialystok Tragedy in Five Acts uh, as a 10-year-old. So just this idea of sort of stripping away these divisions and realizing, like, hey, we're all human beings, uh, that's the, the one— like at the root, that's what we are, and we all literally have that in common, yet we divide ourselves. Like it's just a remarkable thing for a kid and a lesson for everybody of all ages still. Yeah. Um, as he was raised, um, he learned Yiddish, which apparently grew out of a, a German dialect that's written in Hebrew. I didn't realize that. But yeah. it's the universal language of the Ashkenazi Jews, the, the Jewish people in Central and Eastern Europe. So he already understood what a, a universal language could do. You could take a Jewish person from Poland and a Jewish person from Czechoslovakia and, and put them in a room and they could speak to one another um, through that second tongue, Yiddish. So he set about kind of trying to modernize Yiddish. Maybe he yeah. could spread that. And then he stopped pretty much in his tracks because he realized that what he was trying to do was say, hey, everybody, um, let's all learn the language of the people you consider criminals and spies. It was like a really hard sell that mm -hmm. he just realized wasn't going to go anywhere. So he abandoned um, trying to sell Yiddish or create a universal language out of Yiddish and just set about creating one from scratch, which is what Esperanto came from. What a setup. It is. It was, it's going pretty well so far. We should release this as a show. <laughs> Best setup ever. I'm going to say it even though it annoys some people. Should we take a break? Uh, I'm going to say it even though it annoys everybody. Yes, <laughs> we should. All right, we'll be right back. All right, so we're back. Uh, really quickly, that sort of made me, before we left and talked about people being annoyed by asking to take a break, uh, that came to mind because I jumped on Reddit recently, on our subreddit, mm -hmm. and actually started an account because there was so much just sort of bad information, like 
Jerry doesn't even work with them anymore. And just all these weird things that people sort of assume that were wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've since learned that that's – and even Redditors kind of said, like, hey, that's kind of a thing. People like surmise a lot. Yeah. So I, I signed up for a few days and answered, like, geez, a lot of questions for, like, a full day. Yeah. And then got right back off, but just wanted people to know if they thought I was some phony that that was really me. And, mo and most people were awesome. You had your own stunt AMA. Yeah, sort of. You know what I don't like about AMAs, though, is it's just that rapid fire sort of thing. Right. So th this was like a slow burn AMA. Gotcha. And it's all still there. A lot of answered questions, like with correct information. And, uh, and like I said, almost everyone is really, really nice. But um, uh, not everyone is. But that's just the nature of online interactions. It's the Internet. That's silly that they think Jerry doesn't work with us anymore. She doesn't I even know. exist. <laughs> Someone was really annoyed, though, about, like, every time they ask if it's time to take a break. And I was like, we do that because we don't script this out. And I'm genuinely wondering if it's a good time to take a break. Yeah. What a weird thing you know? to be upset about. It's a conversation. Anyway, uh, thanks to everyone who participated. And, and you can go there and check it out if you want. Uh, back to Esperanto. Yes. You want me to pick it up? Because we don't yeah. script this stuff. <laughs> Why did you ask me that? That's so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we said that that uh, L.L. Zamenhof had said, okay, I'm going to start from scratch. I'm going to create a language that doesn't come from anywhere, that's not spoken by anybody. I'm going to make this universal language from scratch. And so his 19th birthday party, he had already done enough that he handed out pocket dictionaries and grammar charts to the guests oh, man. of his birthday. <laughs> Which what is, a swinging party. <laughs> that's right. right. <laughs> For a 19-year-old. He called the new language linguo internacia, or no, internazia, because that sees its, remember? Yeah, yeah. And he composed a little hymn, uh, and I kind of taught myself how to pronounce it, even though I'm going to completely screw it up, but may I? You got to sing it, though. No. Yeah. No, you don't. You have to say it solemnly like this. Mala okay. de las nazias, cado, cado, yam tempesta, la tot homose in familia, co une gare sodebe. Nice work. Can I tell everyone what it means? Yes, but you have to sing it. Okay. Let the hatred of the nations fall, fall, fall. fall. The time is already here. All humanity must unite. In one family. It doesn't rhyme. Yeah. Someone on nice Reddit just sentiment. said it didn't rhyme. <laughs> so he's cruising with this thing. He has this banging 19th birthday party where he's giving out this stuff to his friends. I'm sure they're just like, who is this guy even? This is amazing. And in 1887, he self-published a pamphlet, a 42-page pamphlet mm -hmm. called, uh, are you going to pronounce this stuff? Uh, Unua Libro. Okay. I thought that was right. It means first book. Uh, and as you'll see, if you notice some of these words sound like other languages, it's it's because like other constructed languages, it's usually based on like the words are based on some other words. Mm -hmm. So when you hear Esperanto, like if you go to watch a scene from the Esperanto William Shatner movie that you can watch on YouTube. Yeah. Incubus. From more, when was that? 60, 66? 66, everybody says, but Turner Classic Movies listed as 65, which I find confusing. Well, but everybody uh, else is 66. I, I side with TCM always. Uh, but if you go to, and you hear, or just, you know, I looked up on YouTube, just like Esperanto Conversations, mm -hmm. or if you bump into Ben Bolin somewhere in Atlanta, <laughs> right. uh, you'll, you'll sit there and you'll go, oh, wow, that sounds a little bit like Spanish, some. And maybe it might sound Italian, which Spanish also sounds kind of Italian sometimes. And so was, a lot of it might sound a little bit familiar, like uh, libro uh, for book. Like that makes sense, like the word library. So just pointing out that when you hear Esperanto words and you think it sounds familiar, it's not by accident. Yeah, the reason why, especially if you are a Westerner, um, three quarters of the root words, he started out with 900 of them, as we'll see, um, are taken from Romance languages. So it's, yeah. it's if you're an English speaker, it's very easy to pick up. That's a much simpler way to say what I said. So in the uh, in the that first book, Unua Libro, which I can I can understand what that means just from the little primer, I, which I have to say hats off to Dave. He put together a primer for us in this article that like 
it, when you go back and research it more widely, you're like, this mm-hmm. is really difficult to like kind of wrangle into one small little ball. And he yeah. managed to do that really, really he well. Did. So way to go, Great Dave. Job. But that first book, Uno Libro, uh, it had some sample translations. It said, here's here's how you, you say this, this stuff. Here's the grammar rules. Here's the dictionary. Here's how you pronounce it. Um, and he, he said that the his pen name, he wrote it as a pen name, Doctoro Esperanto, or <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Hopeful is what I it means. I love it. Um, and he called, again, his, his language the lingvo internatia. And that's what he thought everybody was going to, to call it. But instead, everybody said, I like this Dr. Hopeful cat. Let's just call his language right. Esperanto. <laughs> Yeah, which is sort of ironic because from the beginning, he was a very humble guy and didn't want to be like he didn't name it, you know, Zamenhofer or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like he didn't want it to be named after him. He didn't want to own it. No, uh, we would call something like this open source today. He didn't want it to be about him. So the fact that he made up a name and that they named it after him anyway is kind of funny. Um, I get the sense that it probably didn't bother him too much because he seemed like a good guy. Sure. Uh, But his goal, um, and we'll talk about sort of the other stuff that came along later as far as his sort of uh, desire to attach other meaning to it. Mm -hmm. But his sort of root goal at the beginning was, I want a language for the love of whoever you worship that is easier to learn than everything else out there. Yeah. Uh, And I want it to be a language, uh, like you've mentioned, sort of from the get-go, that can unite people and promote peace, like two very sort of noble pursuits, I think. So, okay, let's talk about goal one, a language that's for the love of whatever you worship, easier to learn than most of the other languages out there, right? Right. Apparently, um, you could learn Esperanto in something like about 40 hours of class time. One one full week of, of learning, you'll walk out of there on the end of the day Friday being able to converse basically in Esperanto, tell people where you live, who you are, what you like, um, point to clouds and in, in, in identifying them correctly. That is— No, don't, don't shoot. How about a plate of cookie and some milk? Exactly. They should teach that first for sure. Yeah. Apparently that's—I mean, I, you can just know without even knowing anything about learning languages. That's really a short amount of time. Um, it takes about 100 to 200 hours to learn French or German to the same degree— uh, there was another person who estimated that for English speakers, um, it's five times easier to learn Esperanto than French or Spanish, 10 times yeah. easier than Russian, and 20 times easier than Chinese. And again, a large part of that is because the root words are taken from Romance languages. So mm-hmm. just recognizing generally being able to make a guess in, in almost every case what word, what that word means, that's a huge leg up. And, and that's why it's so much easier in part. But the other part is... The grammar that he he created is so standard and yeah. with such regularity that that that's the other part that makes it that much easier to learn, especially for Romance language speakers. Yeah, I mean, the hard part about learning a language is usually not memorizing root words and learning basic grammar. It's the irregular verbs. It's all these uh, exceptions to rules. Um, French has more than 2,000 irregular verbs. Uh, English is n- notoriously tough to uh, to learn as a as a non native speaker. Yeah, think about so, this. Just about irregular verbs, real quick, Chuck. For the English to be, pretty basic stuff. The it's conjugated as be, being, been, are, am, is, was, and were. Now, if you were just approaching those words as a non English speaker to begin with. You wouldn't think was had anything to do with be or are has anything to do with be. And that's that's what causes the confusion in not just English, but almost any language, irregular verbs and exceptions to the standard rules. Yeah. And, you know, we did a we did a whole episode on language acquisition, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure. Sure we did. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm just consistently knocked out that babies and to toddlers and so on just just pick up language. It's really remarkable to me still uh, to see that kind of thing. But um, Esperanto, and we're just going to go over some sort of the base rules here, and I think you will find yourself like we did just saying, oh, my God, that's amazing, and it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are 16 grammatical rules. There are no irregular verbs. There are no exceptions to rules. Um, And these are just, this isn't everything, but these are just a few examples of kind of like how much sense it, it makes. 
Um, all nouns are going to end with the letter O. Mm -hmm. That's why I said jerk wado at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, adjectives all, all of them end in the letter A. Uh, adverbs all in, uh, end in the letter E. Uh, there are no genders. That's a, another place where learning a, a foreign language can be confusing is, mm -hmm. you know, the different cases and genders and stuff like that and having to change things around. Not in Esperanto, my friend. Uh, and then this is sort of just a fun one. Um, la, L-A, uh, is the only word for the. Right. Not la, le, lo, il, none of that stuff. L. Yeah. None of that. It's all la, the, everything. And then it's up to the conjugation of the verb that, um, that, that changes that or the adverb or the adjective or whatever. Because it's standard when you see like an O or an A or an E, you can identify a word in a sentence as a verb, an adverb, a noun, that kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. So the infinitive form of verbs, and by the way, I had to look most of this up. Like I was like, what's an adverb again? English 101. <laughs> an adverb is something like above, clearly, hourly. It, um, it, it, it describes an adjective, a verb, or some other stuff. An infinitive form is like to something, to do, like the basic form, like to eat. It ends in an I, so it's uh, manji. Okay? Okay. Present tense, like I eat, that would be as manjas. It ends in A-S. Yeah, and we should point out that it doesn't matter who is eating. If he is eating or I'm eating or she's eating or they're eating, yep. it's all it's all the same. Exactly. There's no irregular verbs. It's beautiful, right? Um, in past tense, uh, instead of something like sing, sang, sung, where it should all just be sing, singed, singed, uh, that's what he does. <laughs> I know it sounds yeah. weird, doesn't it? Well, sure. But um, that's what he does in this. Everything in past tense ends in ES, so manges. Um, yeah. every, I ate, you ate. They ate. It's all. It's all manjes. And then with future, it's manjos. And then with a command, you just add a, a, a u, a, u manju, and that's it. That's how you conjugate verbs. There's no exceptions to that rule at all. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, I, I guess it just makes sense that because uh, uh, I kind of struggled with why other languages are so irregular, but. If it's organic in its growth, then that's just bound to happen, I think. It is. Um, I looked up why, and it's actually fascinating. It's because these languages often um, absorb other people from other language groups, and they bring their words with oh, yeah. them. And uh -huh. so languages grow by adopting other words, changing. And so it's, it, rather than completely altering, you know, how um, something that usually ends in ED, like sing, uh -huh. Instead of just totally altering how it used to be, you just kind of change it to the new form, like sang or sung. It just it that that's how irregular verbs come up. Nobody's like, I really want to screw people up in the future. I'm going to add this. It just happens, right. you know, organically. So when you set about creating a constructed language, you can purposely, deliberately avoid any irregular verbs and make it that much easier to learn. My question that came up, Chuck, is. Um, how long, yes, I said up, Chuck, how long does it take <laughs> until a language like um, Esperanto starts developing irregular verbs? Well, I have a strong feeling, and I'd love to hear from some Esperantists, that they fight that tooth and nail because that defeats the whole purpose and spirit of it. Okay, hasn't happened yet then is that answer. I mean, that would be my guess. Um, yeah, I'm on record. Okay, <laughs> I'd love to hear from them too, though. Uh, but if you haven't noticed uh, that Esperanto, and, and this is a word you might not know, but it's called an agglutinative language, which is the words are formed from combinations of shorter words, basically, which English has a lot of those. All language has a lot of those, but Esperanto has all those. Yeah. Um, so you've got your root word, and then you have affixes, prefixes and suffixes, and um, kind of like how you conjugate it with the I for to eat or in AS for you eat, um, that's that's it. That's the whole that's the whole grammar, right? So um, the reason why he did this again because uh, not just like irregular verbs, but weird words that all describe the same thing is another yeah. thing that creeps into language organically. And Dave used the ex the uh, example of tree. 
right? Good one, yeah. You know what a tree is in English? It's one of those plants that's got the wood and the bark and the leaves, and they're tall and everything. <laughs> Everybody loves to hug them, right? Uh-huh. Tree makes sense. But rather than um, young tree, we have the word sapling, which combines yeah. Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Germanic words. In English. Cute word, though. Sapling, it is, because it means yeah. young tree. It's the young version of a tree. It's very cute. A bunch of trees uh, is called a forest. That's Old French from Latin. And then a botanical garden that has a bunch of trees is an arboretum. That's just straight up Latin. All of those are English words, sapling, forest, arboretum, and none of them sound like tree. So by creating roots that just describe one thing and then adjusting what they mean by adding a prefix or a suffix, but keeping that root word, he got around that kind of conundrum. Yeah. So, for instance, tree in Esperanto is arbo. Uh, that young tree, which is a sapling for us, is an arbido. And as we'll see, I-D-O is sort of the suffix for any kind of baby version of something, which is taken, uh, I know Spanish does that, like uh, – there were two Chucks at my job at a Mexican restaurant, mm-hmm. and I was Chuckito. Cute. Because I was younger than the original Chuck. Wasn't that a Taco Bell menu item in the 90s? Probably so. <laughs> uh, two Chuckitos and... Uh, another Chuckito. And another Chuckito. Three Chuckitos. Uh, a young tree, instead of uh, a sapling, is an arbido. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of trees, instead of a forest, is an arbaro. Mm-hmm. And then that botanical garden, instead of an arboretum, is an arboreto. And you might think, well, that sounds a lot like ar- arboretum. Well, it does, but it also sounds like arbo, arbido, and abaro. Exactly, right? So you see any of those words and you know it's talking about a tree. And then when you learn edo means the younger version of it or aro means the, um, the, uh, like a group of whatever you're talking about, you just learned a ton of grammar just right off the bat. And then also note that all those end in o – because they're all nouns. And again, all nouns end in O in Esperanto. Yeah, so we mentioned Edo. I-D-O is a suffix meaning like the small version of something or a baby something. Uh, and we also mentioned that there wasn't gender. That There is, but uh, not in terms of like, you know, how you will conjugate a sentence. Uh, it's just a suffix. It's I-N-O is a female version of something. Right. Uh, You also have A-R-O, which is a group like Vorto, V-O-R-T-O is a word. Vortaro is dictionary. Uh, It just makes a lot of sense. E-J-O, and uh, the J's are pronounced as a Y. Isn't that right? (laughs) Yep. Uh, E-J-O is a place for something. So K-U-I-R-I, how would you pronounce that? Kuireo. Kuireo. Oh, Kuri. Why did you ask me to pronounce this? Well, because Kuiri. You, I got you it practice. now. Kuiri is to cook, and then uh, what's kitchen? <laughs> Kuireo. Right. So you add the EJO. So uh, that is the place where you would cook. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Yeah. That's not to say that the Esperanto doesn't have words that you just have to memorize because that doesn't quite work. Because, um, for example, there's a couple of places where you'll find a lot of books, like a library or a bookstore. Right. So a library you'd think would be called the libreo or place of books, but actually it's called mm-hmm. a biblioteco. A libreo is the bookstore. So it sounds like just kind of um, nitpicking, but if you ever arrange to meet your friend at the libreo and they don't, they think that that's the bookstore, you're going to be right. sitting there waiting in the library <laughs> for them a long time. Uh, yeah, and in fact, you know, adding and and I find this like part of the spirit of Esperanto is super cool in that they encourage you to create words as long as they follow the rules and make sense. So to to uh, tack these uh, affixes and suffixes onto root words, and Dave used this, this is so great. Gosh, this just makes me crazy how great it is. Hospital. The word hospital in Esperanto is uh, mal sanu lejo, right? Yes. Does that make sense? Yep. So M- M-A-L in Esperanto is opposite of. Uh, the S-A-N is healthy. Mm-hmm. The U-L means people. The E-J-O, remember, as we said, means the place where something is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so a hospital directly translated is not healthy people place. <laughs> That's Which great. could be a lot of places here in the U.S. But <laughs> so it's kind of like um, Esperantists like to put words together like you do in a Scrabble game. And the, yeah. the reason that it's encouraged is because out of the gate, 
um, Zamenhof, like like you said, made this open source and um, said, here, take this uh, and just do what you will with it and make it grow. And that's how, that's why Esperanto is still around. And one of the reasons it supplanted Volapük, Puk, um, because the guy who created Volapük, uh, he, he was very controlling, kept a controlling like um, um, grip on it. And so that made it like a dying language right out of the gate because you, you have to let language grow and become organic on its own. Apparently, he was like, nope, God told me to do this, so I really need to keep a sharp eye on it. So I think we should also talk about the word for jet lag because it's also just super fun. Yeah. And we could do this all day long, but just these two examples are really great. Mm-hmm. Uh, horzonozo. Horzonozo. Mm-hmm. Uh, H-O-R-Z-O-N-O-Z-O. Exactly how it sounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is H-O-R is time, uh, zone is Z-O-N, and then illness is Ozo. So the Esperanto translation is time zone illness. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I love that. And that sounds, It's a lot of this sounds like how it would be uh, uh, transcribed or subtitled in like China or something <laughs> from from English. Yeah, for sure. That, I, I came across something. Did you see what I sent you about um, English translated into English is kind of hilarious? Oh, no. Oh, you didn't? I found a, a, I don't remember what paper it was, but um, as an example, they translated, I do not understand into several languages. And one Uh of them was English. And if you literally translate, I do not understand into English, it's I make not understand. (laughs) Think about it. Like, that's exactly what that means. But it's not at all what you think of. Like, I do not understand sounds right, even though what you're saying literally is I make not understand. Because do means make. I, I literally. <laughs> I do not understand. I just I I had to mention that it just cracked me up. No, that's really funny. Uh, all right, so let's take our second break. I'm not even asking this time, and we'll come back and talk about where Esperanto went from there. Right after this. <laughs> So, Chuck, um, we talked a lot about how um, how uh, Dr. Esperanto, Zamenhof, the reasons why he created Esperanto. And that was goal number two, was to, to create like a language that united the world, right? Easy to learn, united the world. And he originally based it um, on something he called uh, Hillelism, after Hillel the, the Elder, a Jewish sage from the first century BCE. And Hillel's... Um, teachings can basically be summed up as the golden rule, like treat others as you'd like them to treat you. Yeah. He changed that name very quickly to uh, homer, homaranismo, which means basically humanitarianism. But the whole idea was the same. He called it the interna ideo, the internal idea of Esperanto, which is that um, it can remove those language barriers, those culture barriers, or barriers between people and to... Um, by doing so, you make people recognize that we're all humans. Yeah. And he, I think, realized at some point, again, that sort of attaching uh, an ism um, to something maybe might um, keep people from wanting to learn it. Mm-hmm. And I think there were also Esperantists. Uh, Dave said there were a lot of them were French intellectuals that were like, no, 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 we, we, we don't need to attach this to an ism. Mm-hmm. Um, so it officially wasn't attached to an ism, but I do think the spirit of all that is a big part of Esperanto still. Yeah, definitely. And people who want to learn it, even though it's not an official like ethic. Yeah. And so, I mean, just right off the bat, the, they had the first uh, international or universal congress of Esperanto in 1905 in France. And in that conference, a schism created or was created in like a whole other language, like a version of Esperanto called Edo that was even oh, easier to learn, was introduced. And that that group just went off and did their own thing, which kind of hamstrung Esperanto as it was really starting to take off. But Edo, you don't hear about any longer. You still hear about Esperanto. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure why. Maybe it is because it had an ethic or a moral to it, in addition to being easy to learn. Uh, that's, like, that's my guess. But Zamenhof died um, in 1917, 
And um, what's sad, Dave points out, he lived long enough to see World War I, yeah. which he – I didn't read anything he wrote about it directly, but he would have been really bummed by that because that is not – that's what he was creating Esperanto to avoid. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he During his life, he was nominated 14 times – 14, never won, unfortunately, for the Nobel Peace Prize. Mm-hmm. And post-World War I, when the League of Nations was created – to, you know, to stop something like that from happening again, didn't work. Uh, in that very first meeting, there was a proposal to teach Esperanto in schools to member countries, mm-hmm. um, which was pretty remarkable. It didn't happen because the the French delegation vetoed that, uh, and they said, uh, French is already the universal language, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is so haughty. But that's they literally kept Esperanto, like who knows where it would be now if they hadn't stopped that. Same thing with the U.S. at, at the United Nations in the 40s uh, after the U.N. was founded. Somebody said, hey, we should all learn Esperanto. And the U.S. said, nope, English is already a universal language. And that actually shows how language can like enhance the standing of the countries that speak that language that the rest of the world sees as basically a universal language and why Esperanto – didn't do that because it didn't come from any country. It didn't come from any ethnic group or any region. It was a from yeah. scratch universal grammar that wouldn't enhance one nation over others. Yeah. Uh, not everyone loved it. Um, if you think, like, who maybe wouldn't like it? Who wouldn't like this language created from a Jewish man? Hitler, you would be correct. Uh, it's written about in Mein Kampf. Uh, he said, Hitler said that it was a secret Jewish language used to plot against Germany. And I don't know if anyone ever went over to him, probably not, and said, uh, De Fuhr, uh, you can actually, it's not secret at all. You can learn it in Fierzig hours conversationally. Mm-hmm. And so, I don't know. Uh, Hitler being Hitler. Uh, there were, uh, and of course, you know, I'm sort of joking about that, but it was no joke at all because Hitler and others would round up um, Esperanto speakers and jail them or kill them. Uh, and in fact, Hitler took uh, his family, his surviving family, that is, uh, to the Warsaw Ghetto and all three of Zamenhof's children were killed by Nazis. Yeah. It's brutal. Stalin did the same thing, which I guess is why it's it seems at first surprising that he um, learned Esperanto, but he called it the language of the spies. So I guess he was just— That's probably why he learned exactly. it. Exactly. But even yeah. if you were a loyal communist party member, um, you would be killed for, for knowing Esperanto, which is funny yeah. because it was frequently accused of being a, a secret communist plot itself. So right. that kind of goes to show you just how nationless Esperanto actually was. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you— Get online today if you're interested in this and you want to know, like, who's how's it going today <laughs> with Esperanto? Who's speaking it? Are people into it? Uh, yeah, people are into it. There is it's, it's not a huge community, but it's a very passionate community of people all over the world, people like Ben Bolin. Mm-hmm. Uh, they find each other online. Uh, it's very easy to do that now. Obviously, before the Internet, they would uh, they would have local clubs and stuff like that. They would have pen pals kind of the way that people would spread any message pre-internet. They were doing that in Esperanto. And there are, you know, there are conferences. I think there's uh, one, the 2024 uh, Universala Congresso is in Tanzania this year, Mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And it sounds just like they they get together, they speak Esperanto, they work hard to keep this language and this idea alive, which is a very, again, I I think it's still a noble pursuit. And Esperanto has its own... um, teaching app, Learn New, with an exclamation point, at (laughs) learnnew.net. You can also pick it up on Duolingo and uh, Babbel. But I looked on Duolingo. They have 381,000 people signed up to learn Esperanto, which is more than Klingon, more than Navajo, and more than Yiddish. It's toward the bottom, but it's still Uh not the last one. 380,000 people worldwide is nothing to sneeze at. Heck no. It's more than Klingon. There's also a couple of podcasts. Radio Esperanto. Radio, by the way, is the same word in English and Esperanto. Oh, already ended with an O. Uh, Usone Persone, American in person. Uh, okay. But you have to probably kind of know already a little bit of Esperanto. Yeah, I meant to check that out. I'm going to listen to one of those and just see if I can understand anything. You'd be like, oh, they said radio again. I know what that means. <laughs> one other thing before we leave. Um, do you have anything else? 
Yeah, I got one. So two other oh, things, I okay, guess. Okay, well, you go first. Oh, okay. Um, 1905, we mentioned that year earlier. What year was that? Was that the first year of— The first Congress, the Universal Congress. The first Congress? Well, that makes sense then, because that was the year that the Esperanto flag uh, was debuted. Mm. It is called the Verda Stello, or the Green Star. Uh, and it's it's nice. It's a green rectangle. It's got a little white square in the upper left corner okay. and a green star inside that white square. Uh, and apparently that was a big part of the branding, uh, the color green. Um, LL early on wanted it to all sort of look the same and feel the same. So his pamphlets and books and everything was in green. And I think green's just a big Esper- or I'm sorry, Verdo is a big uh, Esperanto color. Yeah. Verda. That's, that's um, branding 101. Branding 101. Uh, okay, well, I'll say mine, and then you can finish with yours. I just wanted to talk about Incubus real quick, that 1965-66 Shatner movie. <laughs> I watched a little bit of I it. I did, too, and it is really hard to follow. And, and when you're listening to them speak, you're like, oh, this is okay. It's Esperanto. If you speak Esperanto, it drives you up the wall because <laughs> apparently no one in the film knew Esperanto. They oh, learned God. their dialogue in two weeks, and there was <laughs> no one who knew Esperanto on the set to coach them. So oh. it's just moment after moment of bad yeah. Esperanto pronunciation. <laughs> and I saw in Quartz, there was an article that quoted like a, a film reviewer from the, the age who said that um, Incubus is like a foreign film from a country that never existed. <laughs> what a great description. I thought so too. It's worth checking out five five minutes of it. Yeah, absolutely. That's it? That's it. Oh, Okay. Uh, well, if you want to know more about Esperanto, everybody, go check it out. You do worse than starting. No, actually, you couldn't do worse than starting with Incubus, but start there anyway. Uh, and since I said Incubus, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, Ain't Quite Right. Hey, guys, listening to the latest episode, I got a kick out of Josh saying that people who request, and this is on dry cleaning, who request a double crease in their pants ain't quite right. I stand by that. Uh, yeah, it's like a Southernism, I guess. Um, I used to live in Miami. Uh, now I'm back in Maryland where I belong. Go Hagerstown Flying Boxcars. <laughs> and I worked as a housekeeper for the opulently wealthy. Uh, one woman, I could name drop, but I won't, requested from her housekeepers that her bed sheets be ironed. No joke. She wanted her flat and fitted king size bed sheets laundered and ironed every day. Wow. Here's the kicker. Uh, This woman almost became my mother-in-law, but I digress. Definitely not quite right. Love the show, guys. It's my news source, my companion, my teacher, and has given an otherwise awkward me plenty of knowledge to be able to connect with someone on almost any topic. And that was a lovely email from the wonderful Ashlyn Powers. Thanks a lot, Ashlyn. That was great. I would advise you against using us as your news source, though. But other than that, thank you very much. Agreed. Uh, if you want to be like Ashlyn and tell us a great little anecdote, leaving out the names to protect the uh, not necessarily innocent, but, you know, just out of tact, you can do so via email. Send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.